Continuing Cup with part two of my conversation with David Bowden, author of Great Rail Journeys in Asia. One of the trains that you have introduced to me, and to my shame, I didn't know about it. So it's in Sabah, the Malaysian Strait of Sabah, which is on the island of Borneo. And it's a train trip that runs from Kota Kinabalu to Tenom. Please tell me about this train, because this one is new to me. Most of the others you've written about, I've either experienced or know about, but I had no idea about this one until I, I read your book, Great Railway Journeys of Asia. It, it's interesting you say it's uh, Borneo is the third largest island in the world, yep. and this is the only train line on the island, and it, it's over a hundred something yep. kilometres, but it goes from the capital of Kota Kinabalu up to what is a very small coffee town called Tenem. Yep. It follows the Padas River. And interestingly, some people go on the train to get off halfway to white water raft down the Padas River and then to join the return train when it comes back from Tenem. It starts off as a rattling old diesel yep. two-car train and you stop halfway, you get on another train, then it takes you to Beaufort, then you get on a, a yep. quite a smart a modern train for the last half hour of the right. journey. But to me, this is a wonderful journey because you get right into the centre. The scenery is wonderful. The preferred journey would probably be, uh, this is the way I last yep. did it, was to actually get a, a minibus to Tenham stay the night, then get the 7.30 train back the next day. But it takes four or five hours. It's just a slow old journey. Pulls up at mere shelters in the middle of yeah. the rainforest. A couple of people get on with some bags of rice yeah. or stuff to sell in the market, a few chickens, and then it continues into town. But, yeah, it's a great journey. It's about five and a half hours, and... If you want to sleep, sit in the cheaper seats, it's about six bucks for the whole journey. That's not bad, really, is it? It's it's, it's not even that <laughs> steep if you're talking Australian dollars. Yeah. It's about two Australian <laughs> dollars, I think. But, yeah, it's, it's the greatest value and probably the most authentic journey. And I, a, a few years ago, I was on that train yeah. and there was a huge rainstorm yeah. and we actually had to get out and help the drivers and the conductor get the mud off the track so the train can continue. So, you know, it's just everybody gets out and gets a few sticks and digs out the mud and off you go. But um, it's a wonderful experience. And as I said, I, could, I don't think you could spend $2 in any better way <laughs> in Asia than that. And I love those local experiences that you have in, in Asia. I know you touch on uh, Myanmar, uh, which is probably not open to, uh, I wouldn't advise people to go to Myanmar as tourists at the moment because it's a little bit unfortunate what's happened there. I took the train from Bagan to Yangon and it was a fabulous experience. I heard this clucking and there, sure enough, there's a couple of hens in a bamboo cage behind my seat and stuff like that and you, and you get to know the locals. You don't really see too many other Westerners on some of these trains and you know what? To me, that's one of the beauties of travelling on some of these lesser-known trains. You're 100% right. And I think one of the nice things is because they see a foreigner on the train, people get so excited and they all want to talk yeah. to you. And, you know, I've been on the trains in Myanmar or when I went yeah. there in Burma, but and everyone is so friendly. Yeah. Talk to you in English. People share stuff. It it's really is the best way. You know, when did someone share something with you on your last aircraft journey? Nobody does that. But on a train, people uh, open up a bag of stuff. And no, they share their seat when they just recline it without letting you know. <laughs> Yeah, yes, I know. But whereas on trains, I, you know, I get on some trains and people stand up for me, you know, and I have to say, no, 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 it's okay. You, you sit down, you, you know. That's because you're an old bugger, David, like me. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But I think it's also Asian respect, it is. isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah. in, in the Asian cultures, yeah. uh, elderly people are given due respect. That's but right. I don't need that. No. So, or well, sometimes you just end up sitting on the floor, you know, like everybody else. That's right. What do you do? The thing I love about the railways of Asia is that you just take them as it comes. I mean, you go to places like, say, Japan and, and China, and they're super modern, super comfortable, super quiet. And then you get in on, a, on an old 
old rattler somewhere in Cambodia or Vietnam. Well, they're, they're not really rattlers in Vietnam, but they're not the most modern trains. And it's just the experience there. The, riding on those railways is just a fabulous experience, I find. You're right. And I think you have to go with the flow. You cannot get on to some of these things and just expect everything to go to normal, except, of course, if you get on a Japanese yeah. train or even a high-speed Chinese trains now where you can set your clock to whatever the timetable is. But and they're nice, don't get no, me no, wrong. I like to sit on a high-speed train scooting across the, the deserts of uh, Western <laughs> China, but I also I love those journeys which are a little bit more interesting and a little bit rough around the edges. But, yep. of course, people need to do their research, yep. and I suppose that was the reason the book was written, so that people can prepare themselves for getting on the train, knowing exactly or, or having a reasonable idea of what's going on. Yep. Uh, things come and go, things change. As you mentioned, not all these trains are getting into Myanmar yep. is, is difficult yep. now. I have I also documented the you know, Trans-Siberian yep. Railway because it connects Europe and Asia. But you know, going on that now could be challenging. Yeah, so yes. <laughs> uh, these will all come back, Steve. Yep. You, know, you, you can't write off no. the Trans-Siberian oh, no. Railway because of current political situations because in five years' time, everyone will be back on the train. That's right. Now, Great Railway Journeys of Asia is the name of the book. Who was it published by, David? It's published by John Beaufoy of the United Kingdom, and John is a uh, John Beaufoy publisher is a specialist in nature studies and also train journeys and travel. He's published uh, I've published well, I don't know fifteen books no. with him. He's publishing books all the time. There are a lot of wonderful books on Australian nature, Australian birds and snakes. Yeah. But there's also a book called Great Railway Journeys of Australia in New Zealand, which oh. I wrote a couple okay. of years ago. And I'm sitting here now updating the new edition. So uh, it will come out in a couple of months and right. be ready for people in Australia to head off and discover that wonderful continent. The other thing about it is the book, not only does it have your excellent stories about the trains, you've got lots of photos in there, you've got lots of maps, etc. So you really can follow the route of uh, many of these trains as well, can't you? It's a large book, it's a coffee table yes. book. I suggest people probably wouldn't stick it in their back pocket when they travel, but it's the sort of thing that you would uh, use to prepare a journey. It's the sort of thing you would sit down on a wet Sunday afternoon and read and say, ooh, I must do a yeah. journey one day. So it's, it's for armchair travellers, it's for travellers who have done the journey, and it's also for potential travellers. So it, and the way I look at it, Steve, it's, it's, it, I, you know, I look at a a journey and think, well, what do I want to know? So there's a bit of yeah. railway technical information, the jargon for people who need to know what sort of yeah. engines pulling it and its horsepower and what how wide the track is and things like that. There's a little bit of history. When was the first train? When did it operate on that journey? But the other information is, especially it, you mentioned the reunification express is, you use the train to get on and off. I'm not sure if I particularly no. want to go up in Ho Chi Minh City to Hanoi, 1,700 no. kilometres in one jump. But to get off four or five times and discover Vietnam, it's perfect. It is. And there's a half a dozen trains a day going yeah. in each direction, so you're only ever going to be waiting a couple of hours. That's right. But now for... Trains like, say, Vietnam, you need to book yep. because it's a popular way of getting around for the locals yeah, that's right. and, and for tourists. That's right. I've been speaking to David Bowden, who was the author of Great Railway Journeys of Asia, full of fascinating stuff if you like trains. Even if you're not all that fond of trains, but you love reading travel books and finding new destinations. It's all in here. It's, it's just great. David Bowden, thank you very much for conversing with me.